Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. Today we're getting back on with that solar job that you will have seen me do in the inverter and battery storage from the last video. We're up on the roof on this one. We're getting the panels installed and doing some commissioning and testing on those. I did get loads of footage up on the roof, but unfortunately the audio was unusable. I hadn't realized, but my microphones were crackling away. In the wind, I'd forgot to put the mufflers on. I thought it'd be odd with me voicing it over and then my mouth moving to different words. So I didn't want to do that. I have clipped out the bits where it was pointing at the roof away from me and voiced that over. So hopefully that's going to come across well in this video. There's some really good content mixed in there. I think we've learned a lot through doing this. And I want to share that with other people who might be following along with a similar journey of their own. In the hope it might help you. Huge thanks to Dan and Stuart, so Dan from DMH and Stuart from K2 Electrical Services who've given me lots of tips and tricks to help us get started from an installer's point of view. It's been really helpful, I am super grateful and they've made our transition into solar a lot smoother than it otherwise would have been 100%. Without further ado, let's get out to site, let's see what we're up to and dig right into it. Okay, so you'll see up on the roof, we've got the brackets and rail all fitted. The brackets simply screw down into the rafters beneath. You push the two tiles above the one you want to lift up and out the way. Lift that tile and grind off the back, allowing it to fit over that hook without damaging the tile. You want a bit of a gap between the top and bottom, so they're not going to get damaged later on. They simply fasten into the rail using an allen bowl and secure it all together in a nice rigid system ready to mount your panels. We've loosely fastened the cables on. These do get fixed all the way along so they're not sat on the roof at final installation and we use some metal cable ties along the way to make sure they're always going to stay there. Panels are all mounted and it's the fasten all rail and fixings. You can see these fastened through and simply clamp down on top of the panels to hold them firmly in position. There's four of those on each panel. This is the open field behind this roof and what was giving us concern about the wind loading. It is quite a windy location. So we maybe have gone a bit over the top on the fixings we've used, but better safe than sorry, especially first time out. We was happy with the result. They look really good from the ground. The customer's very happy and let's see how this lot tests out. Using the TIS clam meter, this is specific for solar. I've got my MC4 leads in the end here so we can check the DC voltage output from the strings. But I was just looking at the flow of current to and from the battery. Obviously this battery will charge and discharge depending on what's going on in the wider system. And when you've got it hooked around one of your battery tails, you can stick it into the AC mode, uh, sorry, the DC mode and check the current flow. You can see we've got quite a bit of juice flowing into that battery because the sun has just come out outside and things have got a little bit sunnier than they were a second ago. And again, you can see that falling away now. So it's quite interesting to see how it reacts based on what's going on outside. So that's the DC TIS um, PV clamp meter. So I'll drop a link in the description to this for those who want to check it out, but it's a thousand amps and you can see, I think it is up to 750 volts on AC and a thousand volts on DC, which is very handy when you're measuring the string voltages. So say you get the MC4 leads that come with a kit and they plug straight into the leads so you can get a safe measurement of your voltage in those as well. We'll run through a test sequence on this now. So this is the PV ISO test. We can check the voltages on the strings and also do our IR, our IR tests. So we'll have a look at that as well. Looking at the generator, you can see we're um, generating power now. So if we go in and have a look at one of the strings, I can remember how to press the buttons and we'll just go in and have a look at system status on PV1. So you can see at the minute we've got 204-ish volts 
and about 500 watts. The sun's in and out, it's cloudy outside, it's about to throw it down with rain actually, so that's um, to be expected. But yeah, just shows you, we've got the five panels on that string, roughly-ish between 40 and 45 volts on each um, panel. Obviously, like I say, it depends how sunny it is to what's going to come off them. You can see they're just watching the current, uh, sorry, the, the power, so the wattage is climbing. So obviously the sun's peaked out from behind a cloud a little bit and um, see how that adjusts. It's interesting, but we'll run through a test sequence on this now and we'll just show you doing all that as well. See, we've got our DC isolators off. The strings are all um, disconnected from the inverter now. I've got an earth connection on the side of this inverter. If I can get my crocodile clip to stay on. I'm now going to connect into one of the strings here and we'll rotate the DC isolator for that particular string. You can see on the instrument here, so PV ISO test from TIS, we've now got voltage showing. So I'm just going to do a very quick test. I've dropped it down to five seconds and just put it in the timer mode because the test process is a little bit on the long side. If we stick it on to run now, you'll know I'm at 500 volts. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about it in a minute. You see we've got an OK value. Now we've just been scratching our heads for a bit because when you put it on a thousand volts and run the test, it isn't very happy about it. And we wondered if we had an issue in our wiring, but then we remembered these. So the SPDs, as you'll see here, so they're rated at 600 volts. So if they see a voltage above 600 volts, they will drop that down into the earth connection, which is why we're seeing this low insulation resistance value down to earth when we're doing the thousand volt test. So something to bear in mind when you're running through this and you need to do the thousand volt test on your strings, you have to take the SPDs out of circuit to do it, which is the way we've got around it. And those test values are absolutely fine when the SPDs are connected. So just a bit of information there that might be helpful to some. And there's some other test sequences within this instrument. So you can do a find your insulation fault. You can do your continuity test. If you go into all of the options, you can see it tells you how to do it. So with this one, we're taking an earth and connecting it into the framing of the panels. And then we're using the um, C lead back to the earth bar and we're just seeing if there's continuity there. And you've also got, what other testers have we got here? Uh, we can have our data stored and transferred. You find faults if you look on the help file again, it tells you you need your pos and neg connected into the string and then back to earth and it'll help you locate your fault. We don't have one so I can't demonstrate that here. Hope you found that useful. So you can see on one of the strings we've currently got 196 volts and 140 watts. If we go back and have a look at the other string, it's about the same as you would expect. Obviously as the sun moves in and out from behind the clouds and the light levels rise and fall, these figures adjust and that's happily sat there doing its thing now. It's um, working very well. If we jump down and look on the front of the battery, you can see that's currently trying to charge itself. It's down under 25% capacity. And obviously it's been discharging while it's cloudy because the consumption in the house has warranted it. You see we've got 10% battery capacity actually left. It won't go any lower than that because we've stopped the drainage below that point. So it'll sit there now and wait for solar energy to start charging. If you want, you can change the settings in this. So it will charge itself up from the grid once it's discharged. But obviously there's no real benefit to that while the customer's not on a tariff to gain any benefit. So it's just going to sit there for the sun to come out and then eventually start to fill itself back up. So I'm back at the desk working through all the paperwork that goes alongside doing solar panel installs. Something to keep in mind, there is a lot of it. Before the work, you've got to design the PV system as is, not just to the point of being able to quote it, but you need to make sure it's going to be structurally sound, that your wind loading sort of calculations are all done, the fixing system you used is appropriate, and the ordering of the materials. Obviously, you've got your G98, 99 and 100 applications, if they're applicable, to get those in order, dealing with the DNO and the paperwork on that side. Obviously the normal day-to-day -day stuff, so your job management things and loading and scheduling, but then afterwards you've got the certification through MCS, making sure all of those ducks are in a row, that you've collated all the ser serial numbers off your install, that the system's been commissioned to work online. There is a lot of admin around it. It is admin heavy, so be aware of that. Other things that I've learned to um, build into the working in solar through the course of doing this, you know, where a good investment in now between... 15 and 20,000 I would say overall just to get up and running doing this 
there are some significant costs that you do need to factor in if it's something you're going to add into your day-to-day -day business services and they will vary based on you know how, how far you want to go into it from the get-go there's loads of equipment that you can buy and um, we've kind of gone middle of the road i would say in what we've done in terms of setting up with equipment but we wanted to ensure we had everything we needed so there's tools to do with your mc4 terminations and the kits you're going to need for that there is also equipment that's unique for working on a roof so you're going to need things to lift tiles and work around felt um, we did have a weatherproofing kit for the tiles to actually enter into this one but it didn't turn up in time so we used the oval conduit again you grind a little slot in the bottom of the tile pass your oval conduit through and bring your strings through in separate ones just so you can identify on the roof more easily you know what's what in terms of that weatherproof seal um, other investments obviously in the test instruments so we use TIS great test equipment everyone who follows me knows that I like that gear anyway but the multimeter is fantastic for when you're up on the roof just to measure the string voltages as you move along so that was a tip we got given by Stuart Cato is to keep an eye on that because if you make an error in your rock wiring um, especially at the end of a string when you've got four cables there to join in it is a bit of a pain in the backside to get back on the roof and start stripping stuff out the way to get to it and put that right so make sure you're monitoring your string voltages as you move across the array and that multimeter is brilliant and i'll show you that in the i think i've showed you that in the video sorry so you should have seen that also the isa test so we've got that to test the ir values i got caught out by the spds so something to be aware of if you end up stood there scratching your head wondering why you've got a not okay result don't forget the spds these ones start dumping to earth at 600 volts obviously when you're doing your thousand volt ir test you're above that and at least i now know that spds actually do do something even if it was a painful experience to go through at the time so yeah you need to take those out of circuit so you can do your ir test and ensure you are just measuring that string and that works with the live voltage there that's the difference from your normal mft when you do an ir testing if that detects voltage it will not run the test sequence whereas this is happy with voltage present while it does the ir test to make sure you've got no leaks to earth so that was an investment the biggest one is insurance and that's the one I guess a lot of people maybe forget about so if you are going into it you do need to tell your insurers you're going to be working on roofs our premiums went up a lot because of that I think they're nervous about electricians been up there messing about with um, roofing structures so it is something to to keep in context when you are setting up to do this and factor into your pricing make sure you cover those things off another thing we've learned away from I guess direct expense in preparation of this but ongoing is work where it does wear out much faster when you're working on abrasive tile surfaces the guys have probably worn through a set of trousers while they're up there to be honest and the boots have suffered as well if any of you have got any tips on work where working on roofs please do let me know boots and clothing because it is going to be a factor going forward we're finding our normal steel toes are a bit slippy but obviously you still need that foot protection so if you've got a specific product that you know works let me know in the comments i would love to find out about that we're doing a bit of research ourselves and drawing a bit of a blank to be honest um so yeah there's that and i guess the main learning point is just handling massive solar panels even when you've got them up on the roof if it's windy and breezy as it was on this job you've got to remember they do act like a sail so you need to keep them um, as tight to the roof structure as possible when you're moving them around be very careful make sure you are monitoring the weather if it becomes unsafe you get off the roof and stop working it is a total mind change to normal regular sparky work and it is a process i guess and in this job we were very focused on paying attention to what we were doing which is why i didn't get as much content as i really wanted so apologies about that, but we're going to be doing this loads more often, so I'll get lots and lots of that in the future. I have invented a winch system that I did want to desperately share on this video, but in the hassle and stress of getting 10 solar panels onto a roof for the first time, I totally forgot to record it, but I'll get that on the next one. It is pretty cool, if I do say so myself. For those of you who saw the power bank invention I created a couple of years ago, it's up there with that one. So I'll share that on another solar lift soon. Um, yeah, otherwise, it was a great first time out. I'm really pleased with the guys. Matty and Nathan are absolute superstars. It's them that want our business to go in this direction. I've got to realise I'm 42 years old now. I'm not going to be active out on the tools for an awful lot longer. Maybe got another 10 years in me at the most, I reckon. 
and they're the ones who are going to be driving this forward. They both want to work in the solar industry. They both put their minds to it, very determined and focused. There's a lot of talk about youngsters out there today who are on the phones all the time and lazy and disinterested. These guys proved that nonsense wrong. They are very much not like that. And I'm really proud of them, proud to have them in the business. I think they're doing a cracking job and I'll support them on their efforts to get into solar in any way I can. I'm much happier on Terra Firma doing the inverter and the batteries, to be honest. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoy all the learning around it as well. So getting a, a handle on the currents flowing in the wrong direction. There's all nuances to pick up around back feeding RCBOs, for example. Somebody commented on the last video actually about that. And it's a great point if we are back feeding through RCBOs. Not so much in the way that they might operate, but do they like it? Will they wear out? Will they start nuisance tripping because of it? It's all stuff to keep in mind and we're going to take that forward onto our future installs as well. Speaking of RCD protection, this inverter didn't actually need it. I put it on because of a belts and braces approach at the outset, but having learned a bit more about back feeding of RCBOs, we've removed that and just fit an MCB. So now it runs through. Our cable doesn't need RCD protection. The inverter doesn't need it. So we're all good. Final circuits have still got RCD protection as they're operating as normal. Um, it's just something there. If we was going to do it in the future, obviously, if you use a normal RCD, C6108, they're not polarity sensitive or flow of current sensitive, they should be fine. So we'd go for a separate uh, consumer unit and just fit one of those for the solar PV system if the inverter and cable route required it. Um, so yeah, that was another thing that we'd learn. And yeah, just digging into the regs again, all about solar. Even though we've got the courses, we've got the experience, there's still lots and lots we're going to learn along the way. Far from experts, we want to get better with every install. That's the intention. The next one we do will be slightly different to this one, I'm sure. We may get less worried about putting so many hooks into the roof in future. Um, I do think we went over the top on that. Said earlier on in the video, we was worried about wind loading, but I think it was a overreaction um, just because it was the first time out doing it, to be honest. The fast and all rail has quite wide spacings. There's um, a good tool in the data sheet on that to look at so you can calculate your spacings. And I think 1200 away from the edges and in the middle would have been fine. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things you learn from experience and we move on. If you have got any questions around this install that you want to ask me, please do let me know. And otherwise, I will see you on the next one.